heard it from up here. So we're looking at Revelation chapter 13 today. Christine was um, giving me a few ideas for what we could talk about. Because Revelation, if you've ever read it, is a very weird book. It has a lot of imagery, a lot of symbols, and Revelation chapter 13 is like one of the ones that if you look at this, if you've never read the book of Revelation before, you're going to look at this and you're going to be like, what in the world is this? So she gave me this image, which is a very good image. It kind of goes with what we're going to be looking at today. But another uh, option she gave me was actually this one, Beast Wars. To me, this appealed to me. Some of you may not know what this is, but to people from a certain generation, this was a, a show in the 90s that I used to watch, and I remember this, because what it was is that it was, if you guys know Transformers, right? Transformers, they Transformers. So Transformers, the whole concept is that these are these, um, these, these aliens that hide in everyday things. Like there could be a car, and it automatically turns into a giant robot. You know, normal things like that. Um, but what Beast Wars was is that it took this concept and made it a little bit more nature friendly. So instead of like cars that turn into robots, you have animals that turn into robots. Right? Logical. Makes perfect sense. So these are like the descendants of the Autobots and the Decepticons. And so I thought about them like, oh, that's cool. But I'm, I didn't know if most people would get it. But I think it makes perfect sense about what we're studying today because you're going to see like this, this mix of animals that are kind of coming together. And the question is, what in the world do all these things mean? Revelation 13 seems to just be one of the most strange chapters in the Bible. So in these minutes that we're going to spend together, I want to just break it down for you and make it super simple. So that if anyone asks, like, what, what do these things stand for? What, what, what is the symbols of the typology? What does this all mean? You'll be able to have an idea for yourself and to share with us. But before we launch into this, I invite you to your friends with me so we can have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, God, thank you so much again for this time you've given us together as we open your word, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We ask that Jesus himself would be revealed to us today through your word. Bless us, quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, give me words to speak so that what I say today can be communicated in the knowledge and the wisdom that can only come from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. So if you're one of these people that likes to have the information right up front, because I can guarantee you that we're going to get a little bit lost in the symbols and it's easy to get over. Like, you're like, wait, wait, hold up. What? What is this? Let me give you the whole, kind of the gist of today's message in one, in one sentence, right at the beginning. It says this. The idea is this. A life without intimacy with God will leave us lost, confused, and incomplete. That's the point of Revelation 13. Revelation 13 is going to give you a few different animals, a few different beasts. But behind all the symbols, behind all the typology, that's the message it wants to leave every single one of us. That if you have a life, it doesn't matter if you're an individual, if you are a church, if you are a corporation, if you are a country. If you have a life that is avoid, devoid of God, you will ultimately be living a life that will leave you lost, confused, and incomplete. Now, Revelation is a book that a lot of people don't study, they don't like to read, because quite honestly, it's a little bit confusing. There's a lot of different interpretations for how Revelation can be understood. If you've never even seen this side of uh, theology before, I'll give you a few brief views on what Revelation can be. People interpret Revelation to be four different ways generally. Either from a preterist, that means that what you read in Revelation was accomplished in the past, from uh, the, the ancient Roman society and the church that was in 70 AD around there, or it's an idealist the idea is that it doesn't really have any sort of impact on your life today. It's just a lot of good, nice ideas. There is the historicist view that says that what happened in the Bible is in 100 AD, it, it, there, there are patterns that repeat over time, right? And it may be that in 70 AD, Paul or uh, John was writing to the people in the early church and they understood what those symbols meant. But throughout history, there will be different kind of different kind of characteristics that will repeat over time in different characters and different events until the second coming of Christ. And then there's the futurist that says all these things are nice, but they're for the end times. That doesn't, it doesn't have any sort of bearing on what we're living today. At some point in the future, that's when all this stuff will kind of happen. Where do I stand? Now, personally, I, I don't want to just go on my opinion. I go with what, you know, generally, because everyone bases this on the Bible. So I'm not going to be like, well, I go with the Bible, says, because everyone goes with what the Bible says, but it comes to different interpretations of it, to be honest with you. But I kind of piece it together a few different ways. 
Revelation 1 starts off with this message. It says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And not just reads aloud. It's blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written. For the time is near. near. So it says at the beginning that the time is near. So you're thinking, okay, near this time. Near the end of the book, Revelation chapter 22, actually the last chapter. This is after, if you read the book, there's like a second coming that happens. And then you're in heaven already at the end. Um, John finishes, or, or um, not, not John, but this is the, the, the angel that was next to John. He tells him this, do not seal up the words of this prophecy for this book, for, of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. So at the beginning and at the end, they were saying that the time is near. So you could say, hold on, so maybe it was near for back then, but maybe not for today. Well, remember, before we started looking at the book of Revelation, we started looking at the book of Last month, we were looking at the book of Daniel. Daniel. Remember, because Daniel and Revelation are parallel books. You remember when we looked at the, the story of Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 2, the big statue, right? There were different metals. At the end, there was this rock that came down and hit the feet of this statue and broke the whole thing off. And then from this uh, statue, the whole world was filled. It was a big kingdom of God. So, to give you this idea of like, what is it, preterist, futurist, idealist, what are we? Let me spell it out for you. This is kind of what we're looking at. So, the top would say that the book of Revelation, if it's a future, uh, future fulfillment, we decapitate the feet, we, or we take off the feet, and we put them in the end. If it's a historicist, we have really, really long toes. <laughs> because it connects from Daniel's time all the way to the end. If it's a preterist, then they have cute little bunny feet. Because it's inconsequential to us today. It doesn't really matter. Uh, my view on this is simple. Is that prophecy, I believe, is being fulfilled. You can look all around you today and realize that the world is heading towards something. You can look all around today, the signs are there. I tend to be a historicist that says that God gave this interpretation to Daniel. And there are certain, to Daniel and John. And so as you look throughout history, the, the symbols that we're going to see, they have been re they've been revealed and they're evident in institutions as well as people, as well as events in the past, but also they can happen in today, in today's world, and you will see them happening even in the future. So, uh, as we're looking at this story today, it's important to understand that the characters we're going to be looking at and that the stories and the symbols that come out are, are looking at this big grand picture that, that kind of has gone on ever since because people have been in this world. So, you remember the first uh, Sabbath of this month, uh, Paulo gave a fantastic talk about, um, about just the big picture of Revelation. Last week, when we had this amazing pianist from Brazil, um, Pastor Lafitte gave us an overview of how there was a woman in Revelation chapter 12, and here she was standing on, on the moon, and she had stars overhead, and there was this big dragon. And so we were remembering how even though there was challenges, there was difficulties, at the end of this, God is gonna prevail. And so that, that was the main, the main gist of Revelation 12. It was giving us the big picture. Yeah. Today, um, we're, we're, we're finishing that last part of Revelation 12 where it says, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what we're looking at here is a, is a, is a, is a scenario of good versus evil. It's a symbol of... God's church, symbolized by this woman in, in white, and the devil, or you can say the, the, the evil that is in the world, symbolized by this dragon, this big red dragon that wants to make war against her. It's this war that's going on. And it's important for us to remember that no matter what we see around us, it's very easy to get caught up in the issues that we face every day with our kids, with, with work problems, with, with whatever you may be dealing with back in your everyday life, right, outside of church. But it's important to take a step back. Take a step back at all these things and say, okay, listen, you have to understand that the Bible's telling you that there is a huge war going on all around you all the time. And you are in the middle of it. The war isn't even about you specifically. You're being used as a tool against what the war is really about, which is against Satan and God. Satan's trying to tell the whole universe that God is arbitrary, that God is evil, that God has this, that, or the other. And he's using us as a way to really either prove his point or to not prove his point. And we are living in this huge war. Good and evil is what it's all about. 
So Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 2, gives us this picture of what, what are some of the tools that Satan is using, some of the big characters, ma major players, that this dragon is using in his war against God's people. So, it starts in Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2 here. It says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up, what does it say? Out of the sea. Okay, so remember, you're not going to go to South Beach and see a, a, an animal coming out. Okay, you're not going to see that. This is symbolic language, but it's going to point us to a very a real spiritual reality. I saw a beast riding, rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horn ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet was like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. So, it's a weird animal. You're not going to see this at Metro Zoo. It's a weird animal. It's something like this. You may find this at a pound, and if you do, run, because it shouldn't be there. It's a weird animal, right? We, we as Adventists, we've maybe gotten used to seeing this because of the prophecies, whatever, but for someone that's never read the Bible, and they look at this, what are they going to think? This is odd. Why all these different beasts? What do these different creatures stand for? Well, this is why it's helpful that we went over the book of Daniel last month. Because you remember seeing these animals before? There's a connection here. If you go back to the book of Daniel chapter 7, it has these same animals. So there is a lion with wings, there is a bear, there is a leopard, and there is this fourth kind of major beast. See, this is basically a composite, a, a, a bringing together of these beasts that we saw before. Are you following me? Yes. So it's just, it, it looks weird, but as, Peter, as John was trying to explain to the early church, what you're going to see here is out of, this, out of this, this, this churning of the water, and actually Daniel also mentioned that these beasts were coming out of the water, you're going to see a combination of all these different um, powers that were talked about in the book of Daniel all coming together to form this one really weird beast, grotesque thing that comes out of the ocean, just like the others. And it continues to say about this beast that came out of the ocean, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound had, was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who is able to make war against the beast? Now, keep in mind, uh, John was, was, uh, was, was sharing a lot of coded language because he couldn't outright say what he was thinking. Uh, he was using words that his readers would have understood, but the people that were, uh, that were, that were kind of uh, looking over him, because remember, he was in jail at the time. If someone was a jailer and said, hey, uh, John, you want to send a letter out to your family? Okay, he was going to read it. And he was going to be like, okay, what's this? This is weird stuff. So he could say, I'm not going to send it to them, or he could send it over. There's one animal that is missing in this description that we saw here. Do you know which one it is? If you look at the combination of Daniel, Daniel had this fourth beast. It's, he doesn't really explain it. He just says this is a really weird beast that comes out. Uh, it has teeth of iron, and, and that it has the horns, but he doesn't mention it. Why doesn't he mention it? This would make a lot of sense. Because if you follow the, 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 the trajectory that Nebuchadnezzar was given, God told Nebuchadnezzar that there were going to be kingdoms after him. Right? You had uh, Babylon, you had Medo-Persia, you had Greece. And the one afterwards, if you follow them, the ones that were under God's people would have been the nation of Rome. So... Who was the authority, the, 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 the authoritative body during the time of John? Rome. Rome. So if you're, if you're a political prisoner of Rome, you're not going to write bad about Rome while you're captured by them. Duh. Like if you're in Cuba, you're like, man, this Castro guy is really bad. Can you send this to my family in Miami? I want them to read this. Like, you're not going to do that. It doesn't make sense. So John had to hide his, his, his idea that there's this beast that's coming together after these major empires that's coming together that is going to be trampling God's people kind of in coded language. So understand that the people of, of the early church when John was writing were being persecuted by this power already. 
they were already be feeling the pressure that would later on take lots of lives from people, claim a lot of martyrs. And he was giving them information that would help them out. Now, for us today, we're not going to have a lot of time to unpack this, so I'm going to have to go briefly over this. Um, we can't just look at the Bible and say, okay, it was the ancient Romans, okay, fine, no problem. Because as I said, if we look at this historic, from a historical point of view, there are certain elements that, yes, were present during the time of Rome, but they can be present even in our day and age today. So, what does this mean? Let's continue on to the next um, section here. Oh, this is, this is good. I, I mentioned this uh, in the last sermon, but this is going to help us today as well as in the future when we look at the rest of the book of Revelation. Um, the book of Revelation, keep this in mind, folks, this is very important for us to remember. It never specifically mentions countries, people, or denominations. It doesn't mention countries themselves, denominations, or people, like people by name. It brings them together through symbols, through symbology. But it's important to keep in mind that sometimes it's, it's easy for us to say, okay, this fits just one situation, but you want to apply it to a larger aspect of this. And I think we talked about this when it came to our look of Babylon a few weeks ago. Remember through Nebuchadnezzar's experience. So when we look at the book of Revelation chapter 17, there's the same beast that comes out again. It's really weird. And then all of a sudden, now it has a woman on top of it. And this woman is dressed in scarlet and she's drinking some wine and she's like, she's drunk. And so there's this really interesting image that comes out. But it's easy for us to think that, oh, this is stuff that happened in the past. It doesn't impact us today. Blah, blah, blah. We're going to talk more about this situation, about this image, in two or three weeks when we get to the book of the three, uh, the three inch messages. But as we're looking at these symbols, keep in mind, as we said, that prophecy is being fulfilled. It's not that it just was fulfilled in the past, but there's certain characters that are going to come up over and over and over again. And we're in the process of seeing God's word being fulfilled in today's day and age. So, Revelation 13, moving ahead here. Tell you guys, we, we have to kind of move a little bit because we're on a, a little tight schedule, but we're making good time. There's another beast that is brought up to our attention. This time we find in Revelation 13, verses 11 and 13. It says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. This is different. The last beast came out of the where? Out of the waters, out of the sea, and this one comes out out of the earth. So there's a difference you have to keep in mind here. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. This was kind of interesting. Like, there's this animal that has two horns like a lamb like beast and speaks like a dragon. Okay, understood. Let's keep going. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose sign was whose deadly wound was healed. He performed great signs so that he makes so he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Again, to the, to, it's not just about explaining what it meant back then, although it's helpful to know this. You remember the story maybe of Elijah on Mount Carmel, Old Testament, a uh, story from about 1st or 2nd Kings, where there's a, a prophet called Eli Elijah who makes fire come down, right, from heaven. He's having this issue with his prophet of Baal. So here's this beast that does these kind of, same kind of miraculous signs in the presence of this other beast. So there's these two animals making signs, but it's not just that they're just making these independent miraculous signs. What it says here is that the whole, that, that everyone who um, is on the earth, they see these signs and they're saying, wow, this is incredible. So they're paying worship to this first beast. It's a very convoluted, twisted description of, of, of a process that's happening. All coming together because of a what? It's a lamb. A lamb-like beast. And I had to look this up because I was, hold on a second. I've never actually seen a lamb with horns. But some of them do have horns. What would you do if there was a beast, or excuse me, there was a little lamb, you went to a petting zoo, you saw this lamb with horns, you're like, oh, okay, that's cool. But then all of a sudden this lamb starts talking like <laughs> You know, a lamb-like beast, we sometimes just gloss over the fact that we've read that there is a lamb that speaks like a dragon. Like, does that not seem weird to anybody? It's very weird. So, 
what does this mean? It's important for us to, to, to look, and again, the symbols behind what John is trying to say will help us to understand this. But I'm just painting out what the, what the, the book says. So in the last few minutes, we're going to unpack some of those symbols and then give you an application and send us on our way, hopefully. Revelation 13 says that from this, um, oh, actually, yeah, this will help us out. The book Great Conjuring tells us something very interesting about this second beast, this lamb-like beast that comes up. And it gives us interpretation of this beast. Um, oh, they do that. The lamb-like beast, lamb-like horns, and dragon voice of, uh, of the symbol point to a striking contradiction here between the professions and the practice of the nation represented in this, in this case. And I'll get to that in a second. The speaking of the nation is the actions of its legislative and judicial authorities. By such action, it will give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles in which it, it, in which it has put forth the foundations of its policy. The prediction that will speak, the prediction that it will speak as a dragon and exercise all the authority of the first beast, plainly foretells a development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that was manifested by the nation represented by the dragon and the leopard like beast. So let me bring this back. Um, you remember that the book of Daniel talks about, they were talking about countries and nations. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Um, the book of Daniel does the same thing. And so it's easy for us to look back and say, well, this, this, this was talking about the persecuting power of the Roman church. And how the Roman church, uh, and I'm not picking on Roman Catholicism specifically, because there was only one church for 1,500 years. So it was just the one church. Um, but there was this power that persecuted God's people. But what, in this case, Ellen White is saying is that this, there's a second beast that comes out who many people have looked at it, especially Protestant um, reformers looked at it and said, well, that, that seems to kind of indicate in some ways that even the country that we're living in right now, the United States. But there's a reality that there's any, if there's any sort of country that espouses to have peaceful outlook on life, but then by its policies, and by its legislative actions, speaks like a dragon that is a dragon-like beast. Let me put it this way. You can say all you want about civil rights or championing positions of truth and, and loving people and loving family, all these things with, which look great on the outside. But when it comes down to it, if you make anything, any policies, or you speak in ways that are contrary to what God would have you do, that is a lamb-like beast where you look okay on the outside, but once you open your mouth, then people see what your true colors are. There can be a lot of lamb-like beast advents going around because they look the part. If you, if, if you don't hear them say anything, they look great. But once you open their mouth, you see what their priorities are, you see that there's a lamb-like beast inside of them, that their hearts are really not converted, that they haven't really changed. So there's something to be said about this. The book of Revelation, again, never specifically mentions countries, people, or denominations. Although they have been repeated, the, the, the policy, the, um, the, the characteristics of these, of these animals can be repeated in people, in nations, in denominations throughout the length of time. There's something specific that this description, uh, there's something, uh, something about this description that involves all of us, really. So uh, here's where I'm wrapping this up here. Um, if we look at these three beasts that we looked at in Revelation chapter 12, which is this major dragon that kind of came out, and he's God's enemy. If we see this first beast, that is a combination of these four beasts in the book of Daniel. Or really three, because the fourth one isn't really mentioned. And we look at this lamb-like beast coming out of the earth, with two horns like a, like a lamb, and then speaking like a dragon. What do these symbols, what do these symbols kind of help point us to? really this. As I've read through the book of Revelation, and specifically these two chapters, I'm seeing that the book is giving us the alternative view. Where you have God's enemy, this dragon, that then gives his power to another kind of lower entity. Where what's, what's important to this first beast, which is the composite of these different animals, right? The lion, the leopard, and the bear. What's, power to, what's important to this uh, particular beast is power, prestige, and control. Because what it says is that the dragon gives this beast its power, its authority. It's interested in, in, in control and in exerting that control. 
It then talks about a second or a third beast out of the ocean, or excuse me, out of the earth that comes out. And this beast is peaceful in its look, but hostile in its actions. Hostile in its actions, the way that it treats others. It looks good on the outside, but as we mentioned, when it comes down to it, its heart is untransformed. So, where do we see this playing in our world? We see it all around us. We see nations, even our very own, that in some cases espouse good things, but wants to uh, say, well, we are a nation that upholds peace and values, but we will still, to give an example, we don't want to lose a, a contract because we're selling arms to other people, but it's to keep us safe. You know, we, and it's not about Republicans, it's not about Democrats. Because again, as we talked about, the Bible isn't concerned with our silly little politics. Because God is sovereign above everybody. Amen. Okay, we sometimes lose ourselves in silly little politics uh, about who's going to get the most votes in November. And the Bible says it doesn't matter. Because at the end of it, it's all going to go away. Because God is sovereign over all these things. Amen. But you can't be a nation that says one nation under, under God and then live a godless life. And a nation isn't just the legislature or the president, it's the citizens, it's us individually. We're collectively a nation. So instead of just looking at other people, the Bible's saying we gotta look at ourselves. Are we people that say, well, we are, we're going to church, we're doing all the right thing, but inside, we're, 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 we look peaceful, but through our actions, we show where our allegiance really lies. And in our work, in our, in our lives, with people we work with, are we interested in climbing up the ladder? Do we want power? Do we want prestige? Do we want control over our lives? Are these the things that we're really interested in instead of having a relationship with God? Then at the end of this, this means that really we are enemies of God. Because many times we work from the top down, but what Revelation is saying, if you look from the bottom up, that's when you see where your religion really, really lies. So what's important to you? Where are your values? What, what do you really spend your time on? That shows which nation, which power you are under. That's what Revelation is trying to tell us. So at the end of this, and I'll finish with this. So Revelation uh, 16 through 18 talks about the mark of the beast. And the famous 666. Six, six. What does that mean? If anyone tells you they know 100% what it means, run. Because... The mark of the beast isn't 666. What it says is that the 666 is a designator or identifier of the mark of the beast. I've heard different ways of what 666 could mean. <laughs> and this is real. People say Disney is 666. Or you can say Monster, the energy drink is 666. Or a Google Chrome because it has 666. Or Visa because it, the VI is 6 in, 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 in Roman, and then the S is 6 in Greek, and then the 6 is the Babylon, or it's the barcodes, or it could be Taco Bell, the mark of the beast. Again, people read the same thing, and they come to very weird conclusions. But it's much simpler than that. It's so much simpler than what, than what we sometimes make it out to be. Humans were created on which day, if you remember? Six. Six. What day did God rest on? Seven. The seventh day. The seventh day being the Sabbath. And so, whenever, when Jesus says, remember, verily, 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 when Jesus repeats things, uh, there's, 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 this, there's this pattern that whenever the Bible, there's something repeated, you need to pay attention to this. And so after all of this description of these different beasts and blah, 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 it says at the end of this, there's this, uh, this, 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 this identifier for revealing who this beast is. And it's number 666. Oh, this is another one that I saw. Uh, the beast one. That was, I thought that was interesting. Um, but it says here that the number of the beast is 666. Beatrice Neal tells us, I think, something very, very point to what this 666 means, and it wraps up what I just finished saying about this whole uh, process of how these, these points us to. Six is legitimate when it leads to seven. It represents man on the first evening of his existence, entering into the celebration of God's creative power. The glory of the creature is right if it leads to the glory of God. 666, however, represents the refusal of man to produce to seven. To give glory to God as creator and redeemer, it represents man's fixation with himself, 
man seeking glory in himself and his own creation. It speaks of the fullness of creation and all creative powers without God. The practice of the absence of God. It demonstrates that it, it demonstrates that unregenerate man is persistently evil. So at the end of this, this is showing us that 666 means an imperfection. And you see this apply in different ways in, in different religions, even in, in, in people's viewpoints, in our in our politics, in our views of the world. Whenever we have any sort of system that puts man in the center of the universe, we are incomplete. We are lost. Or as I said at the very beginning, a life without God, without intimacy with God, will leave us lost, leave us confused, and leave us incomplete. It's like humans being created on the sixth day and never really experiencing God's creation. And a lot of us, we stay there. We don't know what it's like to live a life that, that is intimate with God, that is, that, is, that, is, that is really growing by leaps and bounds. And if we stay at that place without knowing God intimately, what a sad place we, we will be. Nelson Mandela, my namesake, good people, said this. There is no passion to be found playing small in settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. And what the Bible is trying to teach us is that the life that we are capable of living is so much bigger than what we have here if it is in connection with God. And if it's not, then we are simply following one of these different beasts that exist. That have come out, this dragon, or this composite piece, or this landmine piece. We are living an incomplete life. So whatever structure, whatever background, whatever belief system we may be, unless we have God at the center of it, we are creating a lie, a false narrative that will put us in the center of it all. So this is the bad news. Next week we're going to start looking at the good news. And it starts off with the 144,000. That's where I want to be a part of. This is where I want to leave us at. Because it's easy to get lost in the doom and gloom of these beasts of Revelation and say, well, what does this leave us at? This ultimately points to what God wants for every one of us, to be part of this 144,000, this great multitude that's going to be in heaven once Jesus comes back. We are going to be conquerors as long as we stay connected with Jesus. I want to tell you, whatever will be going on in your life, I understand it's, we are, in this room we collectively have a lot on our plates. No matter what you may be going through, the message that God wants you to understand today is that the other option to try to do things yourself or to try to follow um, to try to follow religions or, or denominations or uh, countries or other anything that puts people and our own logic and our own experience our own wisdom at the center of it all is going to leave us lost 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 because it's not about what we do it's all about the land there's only one character in the book of Revelation that was found worthy to open the seals. There's only one character in the whole world that is worthy to, to, to march into God's presence. And it's this same character that we worship today. And that's through Jesus Christ. So unless you have that relationship, I love what we're said today. I'm not here to sell you a view of theology. I'm here to sell you a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the question is, would you want to take it or do you want to stay in God? The question's up to you. God bless you.